Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for calling in and joining us on this webinar today. Uh, before we get started with our three folks from um, Oregon, Missouri, and North Carolina today, um, I'm going to just go over a couple of items with you. Um, my name is Kat, and I'm the Prevention Program Coordinator here at the Washington State Sexual Assault Coalition, WICSAP. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies engaged in the elimination of sexual violence by providing information, training, and support to programs and individuals who support victims, families, and friends, and anyone whose lives have been affected by sexual assault. We like to say that we're the advocate's advocate. So if you're here in Washington and you've got some questions about um, you know, how your advocacy, prevention, uh, community outreach, or organizing uh, efforts, you know, can look different or things you're working on, please give any of us a call. We are a team of 13 staff, and the bulk of us are um, what you would call technical assistance providers, which sounds like a bunch of jargon, and really it just means we're here to help you do your work. So if you haven't been to our website before, which is wcsap.org, uh, go there and check out the resources and upcoming trainings and conferences, especially like our annual conference, which is coming up just in about a month, uh, and it will be in Spokane, Washington. And it's a two-and-a-half-day conference, um, but there is also a full day-long pre-conference. And we're really excited about the group of keynotes, presenters, um, and other networking opportunities that will be available there. So if you have any questions about that, You'll find it on our website, but of course, just give us a call or send any of us an email as well. A couple of logistics for you today. Uh, your line has been muted, so we do want to hear from you, though, so please use that chat feature. It's in the left corner. You can send any questions you have. They'll only come to myself, the chairperson. It's not a group chat feature. So. Uh, that means your questions can also be anonymous. If you, uh, you know, want to ask a question, it's nice that you can just send it in the chat feature. Um, our presenters today will answer any questions about uh, their own state work, if you have them, while they're on the line. If you have any big, broad questions, though, uh, we will have time at the very end just to talk more um, with whatever it is that you want to know that can help you design comprehensive and saturated prevention programming. Uh, at the end of the webinar, you should get an email. There's a little follow-up that says you can print this for your record. If you would like to document your training attendance, you'll get an hour and a half of ongoing training hours for those of you who are funded through OCVA, um, as well as uh, a link to take a quick evaluation and a copy of the slides of a PDF. The recording will be up on our website within about a week, so if you want to re-listen to it or uh, share it with someone else in your office, that link will be up very shortly. So the goal for today is to really uh, spend a little bit of time thinking about what it really can look like practically to have saturated resources at an agency just dedicated to the primary prevention of sexual violence. Here in Washington, our federal funds that allow for that work have been spread throughout the state, and there have been a lot of really great benefits of that approach. But we also know that there can be really new and exciting in-depth work that happens when you saturate that, um, those resources into a community. So we wanted to get an idea of what some other states have been able to help support in communities that they work with. Um, so we'll be talking to these three other states who have already had these kind of saturated resources at their local programs. They'll be sharing a little bit about their states as well as some interesting information about some programs that they think are doing really exciting work. So the goal is to really highlight some tangible examples of a variety of prevention programming that's comprehensive and saturated, that really works across the social ecology model, um, you know, addresses risk and protective factors, and really you know, makes the most of what we know through best practice and helps it become, uh, you know, meaningful and realistic in a community. So if you have any questions um, for myself at the coalition about what this shift is looking like in Washington, feel free to give me a call or an email after the webinar. Some of you may be considering applying to the new competitive solicitation uh, that is using the RPE funds here in Washington. If you have any grant logistic questions, you should definitely follow up with um, OCVA, but please feel free to contact me for technical assistance as you think about what this work will look like at your agency. Before we get 
started, uh, I'll share our agenda with you. Then I'm going to really quickly review uh, some guidance around what saturation and comprehensive services look like. Um, we're going to hear the stories about community profiles and state experiences in Missouri, North Carolina, and Oregon. And then additionally, our three preventionists will be also sharing some lessons learned, tips from success that they've kind of garnered over their years at their coalitions. And finally, of course, we will address your questions. So a really quick um, little overview here of comprehensive prevention programming. So when we say that, we're talking about a saturated effort with a defined community. So instead of spreading resources across your whole county or across multiple groups of people, it's about doing ongoing work with a smaller group of people in order to create the most uh, welcoming environment for actual social change to happen. Additionally, this type of work focuses on preventing perpetration. It is consistent with the nine principles. Uh, it works across at least two levels of the social ecology in order to really have the most impact on people and communities, addresses risk and protective factors, is informed and really relevant to the needs and the resources of the community that you're working with. So it's really doing work with them, not at them. Uh, it's per doing health promotion. So it's not just about that we don't want sexual violence, but what do we want and what can that really look like for folks? And that we build skills, both for individuals and for communities, to actually really embrace prevention, to you know take some ownership and make it something that they really want to see nurtured in their community. And that fun buzzword that it includes some level of evaluation that we all really want to make sure that we are doing the best we can with what we have. And so we're collecting some data to keep us, you know, informed of um, how that is happening. So that was very, very fast. So you might be saying, what was that? If you would like to know more about these prevention concepts, we have a web, a web page, a prevention web page, sorry, on our website where we review the social ecology model, the nine principles, public health, risk and protective factors, all of those buzzwords that I just mentioned. Unfortunately, we will not have time to define and go into those on our webinar today. So I encourage you to check out these links if you would like to know more. And then, of course, follow up with me here at the Coalition if you want to talk about that in more depth. So now that I've got all of these boring overviews out of the way, we can get started with our exciting profile. So, we uh, have decided to move from east to west today, so we're going to get started with Jen in North Carolina. So, Jen, you are welcome to get started. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi, folks. Thanks so much for having me this afternoon. Um, I'm Jen Shavaznik, and I'm the Director of Prevention and Evaluation with the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I've been with um, NCCASA for about almost five years. Prior to that, I spent a little bit of time at the State Health Department in North Carolina as the evaluator for the RPE program. So I do have um, both kind of the, the DHHS perspective and the coalition perspective. And I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how, how we, the coalition, fit together with DHHS in just a minute. So in turn, I'm going to talk, folks, I'm going to talk about uh, what North Carolina RPE looked like in the past, what it looks currently like currently, and then spotlight a program so you can get a sense of how, we're, of how a community is understanding primary prevention, what it needs to look like in their community, and how I'm slash we are providing technical assistance um, around that. So prior to 2008, which uh, is, is the year that CDC uh, really provided a lot of recommend funding structure um, recommendations. That was also the year that North Carolina decided to really significantly change its funding structure. Prior to 2008, every rape crisis center in North Carolina was funded at a level of about uh, $14,000. That point, or in those years prior, I should, I should say, so about 1999 to 2007, there were between 68 and 86, I believe the numbers are, rape crisis centers or dual agencies who were funded, who were each funded at a $14,000 level. What I will say is that uh, at that point, in those years, 
DHHS did not keep any of that money. So DHHS was, a, was in North Carolina was a pass-through agency and disseminated all of that money downward to local programs and to NCCASA. That structure has since changed, so I'm going to talk about that as well. In 2008, a meeting was held between a number of key stakeholders in North Carolina, the Department of Public Health, us, NCCASA, and then five rape crisis center representatives, wherein there was a decision made to change the funding structure. And that was based on really better practices that were coming out in the field, some advice that CDC was handing down, and a lot of what we heard other states were doing in terms of modifying those formulas. We also had a really strong sense by that time that the $14,000 amount was not providing a local program with the funding that they needed to really translate comprehensive programming the way we were thinking about comprehensive programming to, to actually the work in their communities. So there was a real kind of disconnect between what the resources we were offering them, what our expectations were for them, and then what was actually possible. And we, we came to a recognition of that around 2008. Since that time, we have funded a much smaller amount of programs at a level that is consistent with providing RPE coordinators a livable wage. Since 2008, additionally, uh, North Carolina requires that local programs who receive RPE funding provide, fund one full-time position using this funding. So again, one full-time position at a livable wage. And of course, you know, we don't have um, control over that, let's say, kind of what what is what that pay structure looks like. But but DHHS does provide kind of consultation and, you know, its own opinion about what that structure should look like based on where that uh where that program is located. So today for uh for the twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen contract cycle, which just started on February first, we fund ten programs Two of those are colleges, so uh, we still fund colleges in North Carolina. I know that some states have never funded colleges. Some states did and do not do, no longer do that. We fund two colleges, the first being UNC Chapel Hill and the second being UNC Greensboro. They are funded in two different tiers um, of our structure, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. But I'm um, sure folks are aware at this point of the media attention that UNC Chapel Hill has gotten. And uh, North Carolina has funded UNC Chapel Hill to, um, under RPE funding since 2008. And we felt very strongly that there we have worked so hard to build so much capacity there and the amazing folks doing work there have worked so hard to build capacity and to create kind of, uh, you know, cross, cross campus and uh, inter-community collaborations that, that we didn't, we wanted to continue to kind of help them, uh, support their efforts. So we, so each program, each of the 10 programs is funded at the $60,000 level at this point. So a little bit about the lay of the land, um, if you will, in North Carolina. So like I said, uh, CDC, disseminates the North Carolina funding to DHHS, which, which happens in, I think, most states at this point. Um, and DHHS keeps some of that money for administrative costs as well as uh, funding a full-time RPE program manager, Glorina Stallworth, and then provides NCCASA with uh, a grant to be the primary trainer and technical assistance provider for not only RPE, but all of North Carolina. So, and I'm that primary training and technical assistance provider. So I provide training to to anyone in North Carolina who, you know, namely rape crisis centers, dual agencies, campuses, allied professionals, who is navigating or interested in continuing to build their sexual violence primary prevention programming. And then uh, DHHS also funds those local programs that I talked about. So, so we're funded through. So we are another grantee of DHHS, but our funding structure um, looks different and you know 
clearly we received we received a bigger grant because uh, we're tasked with be, being that primary training and technical assistance provider. So DHHS in North Carolina doesn't provide any training and technical assistance necessarily to RPE grantees um, that is content specific. That that would be my job. So here's a map of North Carolina, all of our counties. We have 100 counties in North Carolina. And then the counties that are currently funded. So you'll see that uh, there's really heavy representation from the middle of the state, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, though, you know, we have, I think, kind of run into this challenge that I think a number of states have experienced where the folks who have the highest capacity are also the folks who keep getting funded because they're writing the they're writing um, they're responding to to RFAs that are really in keeping with what we think sexual violence primary prevention programming should look like. So the programs that are in kind of the north central part of the state are I would say some of the highest capacity programs. That's also where UNC Chapel Hill is in Orange County. Um, as well as Orange County Rape Crisis Center, which is one of our highest capacity programs in the state. And uh, we also have, uh, in kind of in the interest of transparency, the northeastern quadrant of North Carolina is a quadrant that uh, has not ever been funded um, post-2008 with our kind of larger funding structure, and that is a challenge as well. But again, we're kind of working to figure out how to create com capacity building opportunities while also continuing to fund programs uh, who are doing amazing work and actually doing work that is reaching far beyond their catchment areas or, or counties, if you will. So also to the far left, you'll see Buncombe County, and some of you may have heard of the city of Asheville, and that's where Buncombe County, uh, Asheville is located in Buncombe County. It's also a very high capacity program. So. So these are the counties that are currently covered under RPE, but again, in Guilford County, we have UNC Greensboro and the Children's Home Society, which is a program, and then in Orange County, we have the Orange County Rape Crisis Center as well as uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So for the 2015 to 2018 funding structure, we tried something different, which I'm pretty excited about. For the first time, North Carolina, North Carolina RPE went to a tiered funding structure. So tier one grantees, and, and the, the RFAs looked slightly different. So tier one grantees are programs that have not been funded with RPE dollars since 2009. So the assumption with these programs is that because they haven't received this um, additional pot of money to do exclusively sexual violence primary prevention programming, that their capacity in that regard is probably a little lower. And so for these Tier 1 programs, they have specific deliverables that are slightly different from the Tier 2 programs. They have a four-month um, uh, a, a, a four long community readiness assessment that they need to complete. So, so the community readiness assessment is a feeder, of course, for uh, what they're going to be doing, what their comprehensive programming is going to look like. So after they complete their community readiness assessment, and they are using the Tri-Ethnic Centers model for folks who are familiar with that, they're going to be writing a program plan based upon those results, uh, and then they're going to need to create a comprehensive community-based strategy, as well as creating a sexual violence prevention community task force. So one of the pieces of North Carolina RPE that I've been super jazzed about since I moved to North Carolina and started doing this work here in 2010 is the requirement that local, um, locally funded RPE programs have a sexual violence prevention community task force. And so this task force is really intended to be in and of itself a community level strategy. So the task force is not, um, cannot be, and it's, it's actually clarified in the contract that the task force cannot be part of the SART, the sexual assault response team. It can't be woven into another pre-existing group. It has to be its own group. So we're pretty excited about that. Eek, I only have five minutes left. Goodness. So the tier two, and of course evaluation. So the tier two programs are required to do, again, a comprehensive community-based strategy, 
And they're also required to recruit a comparison group for evaluation purposes. So that's a higher level evaluation methodology that the Tier 1 programs are not required to do. But we're trying to kind of raise the bar a bit in terms of um, proving that local programs are, are, uh, are intervening in their community in ways that are working. They're also required to do a sexual violence prevention task force and then, of course, evaluate that work. The model for the community assessment is the Tri-Ethnic Centers model. It's out of the University of Colorado. So let me, I'm going to um, share with you all a bit of a spotlight on a local program, and that's the Family Violence Rape Crisis Services in Chatham County. So FBRC of Chatham County is a dual agency. They're located in a largely self-identified rural county in central North Carolina. I said self-identified um, very purposefully, they uh, one one may not look at Chatham County and see it as rural, but in North Carolina, it is considered a rural county. Um, there are uh, there's a lot of agriculture that happens in that county, and compared to a lot of other states with fairly sizable towns, which Chatham County has, um, it is uh, folks are are fairly spread out. I know that's a very kind of humdrum definition of rural, but, but th those are kind of the ways in which North Carolina often thinks about rural. So FERC is currently a Tier 2 grantee, meaning that they've been funded since 2008, um, and that funding has been consistent. Uh, Chatham County has, um, has approximately 63,500 people within, a 709, uh, within 709 square miles, and there is one full-time coordinator. His name is Mark Smith, and he is wonderful. So just to give you a sense of this kind of saturation or comprehensive programming that Kat was talking about, we require our Tier 2 programs to work on at least three levels of the social ecology simultaneously. So largely what that means is that folks are working on the individual relationship and community levels. So for FDRC, the reason I wanted to highlight them is because they, have, they are doing the multi-session programming in schools. A lot of our programs are doing that. Um, one of the things that they're doing that I am so excited about that I think has been really interesting and unique and innovative is that they are thinking of gay-straight alliances in schools as a sexual violence primary prevention strategy. And so um, FBRC, in collaboration with student leaders in two high schools in Chatham County, have worked to create the first ever gay-straight alliances in Chatham County. And they're working with school administrators to develop institutional policies that promotes safety, equal protection, and educational equity, as well as working with those student leaders in those schools to act um, as advocates on behalf of other students. They're also building and sustaining those intercommunity collaborations between various committees that work for a just and equitable Chatham County. So they're seeing their issue not just as sexual violence prevention, but um, as in an intersectional issue. So they're looking, they're working with um, United Farm Workers in Chatham County. They're working with folks, racial justice folks in Chatham County. And so they're looking at this as an intersectional issue, and they actually share space with a lot of folks who are doing fantastic social justice work. So this piece about GSAs as a primary prevention strategy, we feel really strongly that, that the creation and, sustain, and sustaining of gay-straight alliances or queer-straight alliances is a primary prevention strategy because we know um, there's a lot of evidence at this point to suggest that climates um, that have really strong LGBTQI plus protections make all kids safer in schools, and also that school connectedness is a strong protective factor. Now, there's not a lot of evidence necessarily to suggest right now that school, protect, school connectedness is a protective factor for sexual violence, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that you can think of school connectedness as a proxy measure because it's a protective factor for a lot of other kinds of violence in schools. So um, we really support this, and here are just a couple flyers. I love the fact that they have a gigantic piece of pizza and that says free because folks like free food, including myself. And this really, um, you know, gives kids a reason to stay after school. And then at the bottom it says um, all students who support LGBTQ people are welcome. So in terms of evaluating FERC strategies, I'm going to really fly through this because I'm out of time. So the coordinator evaluates every piece of this. Of course, this is imperfect right now. We are constantly working on this and shifting things based upon what we feel like is working and not working. But the coordinator evaluates the classroom-based sessions using mixed methods, so using both quantitative and qualitative methods. 
they're using school climate measures to evaluate the effectiveness of gay-straight alliances. So thinking about how could you measure school climate and use those indicators as ways to understand whether gay-straight alliances are having a positive impact on school, on school environment for everybody. They're, used, they're evaluating their task force at this point using uh, process measures, and we're working on outcome indicators right now for those. And then additionally in North Carolina, finally, we're working on a minimum data set to measure all success across all of the programs. And of course, that's really challenging because we don't mandate they do any specific programs. Of course, we highly recommend things. We don't mandate things. But right now, we're working on that minimum data set so we could say, uh, North Carolina RPE programs are doing really well in X, Y, and Z ways. And so once we get that data, I feel really good that we're going to be able to um, say a few things about kind of um, in terms of aggregated ways about how North Carolina is doing in terms of its RPE programming. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. And of course, if you have any questions, you can um, ask me at the end. Jen, thank you so much. I know you had a ton of information. and. Um, we are trying to make the most of our hour and a half, so we didn't give you a ton of time. But um, please send any chat, uh, questions for Jen in the chat feature, and we will make sure to address those at the end of our webinar today. And next, we will turn it over to Matthew in Missouri. All right. Hello, everyone. Hi. And I am ready to go with my slide. So I am Matthew Huffman. I work at the Missouri Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, I have been here for three years now, and prior to that, I worked at the local program in Columbia, um, where I started out as an advocate in the shelter. And then after working in shelter for a couple of years, um, my background is more in public health and community organizing, and I really wanted to get back to that. So. We uh, actually received uh, money through the RPE program, and uh, I helped to really kind of focus in our youth outreach efforts as the youth outreach coordinator there. So to give an overview of MCA DSV and what our members look like, um, uh, the Missouri Coalition is a dual coalition, and so our members are made up of uh, um, also dual programs that are doing both DV and SV work, and then we have some standalone programs that are just domestic violence shelters, as well as standalone programs that are rape crisis centers solely. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, 123 member programs with 1,936 total staff, um, which can vary, you know, day to day, um, and then over 3,000 volunteers at those programs. We also have 50 of our member programs that are engaged in primary prevention efforts. And so uh, I mention all of that, as well as uh, having the caveat in there that the RPE funds are and have always been the only state-managed prevention funding. So very similar to what Jen said in North Carolina, uh, the RPE funding comes down from the CDC it goes to our Office of, on Women's Health in our Department of Health and Human Services, and then they put out an RFA and a competitive bid to get those funds. So what that kind of means for the coalition and our role with our member programs, our members and then the services that they provide in their communities are all over the place. Um, it's really hard to say that one prevention program or one strategy would work for every program, and we recognized that really early on. So in 2009, we, uh, we were in partnership with um, 1918, rather, other state coalitions that participated in the CDC's Delta PrEP program, and that was the two-year program that really helped the coalition build up our efforts to build our own organizational capacity to be doing really comprehensive primary prevention work on a statewide level. But then in doing that, it also helped us to develop our capacity to assist our member programs in building their own capacity to implement really comprehensive primary prevention programming in their local communities. And so similar to um, North Carolina, the Department of Health also contracts with us to provide training and technical assistance to RPE contractors as well as all of our members to really help them build up their primary prevention programming. Um, but whenever I talk about 
the RP program in Missouri, I'm going to exclude the coalition as one of the grantees and really focus on just those local grantees. So I also want to mention that we have gone through quite a bit of change in Missouri as well. And uh, that change is normal and it's necessary to really get down to doing quality prevention work on the local level. So in the fiscal years uh, 2011 through 13, we had 13 organizations that were funded at very different levels. They were doing a variety of strategies and it was really hard to keep track of everything that they were doing. It was very hard to evaluate everything that was going on and really measure the impact of the programming that was happening there. So also in 2011, our Department of Health worked with the University of Missouri Institute of Public Policy to evaluate our RPE program. And one of the main themes of that evaluation was to really focus in on funding. And many of those 13 agencies responded that they were highly dependent on state and federal grants in order to have their prevention funding. Um, and uh, they couldn't really find other ways for the community to sustain prevention. And so uh, at the coalition and at the Department of Health, we recognized that that can be really risky for local programs if they're so dependent on state and federal funding that it's showing us that they don't have a lot of buy-in at their local level. And uh, that really reinforced for us the importance of encouraging community coalition building as well as really making sure that our local programs had uh, developed an organizational investment to uh, put primary prevention efforts to the same level of efficacy as their intervention services. So I say all of that, again, to reinforce that prevention in Missouri has been a process and uh, that now we're in a position where we can really start measuring the impact of prevention programming but it took us a lot of time and it also took us a lot of patience in order to get there. So now in uh, the current funding cycle in 2014, um, moving on, we are really focusing on funding five organizations and all of those organizations are implementing some version of the Green Dot program. And so we have two colleges that we're funding um, and uh, then we have one program that's implementing in the high school and then two programs that are implementing in middle schools. And uh, this is now where we've gotten to the point that we are really looking at measuring what level of impact doing one strategy can have and how we can track those long-term outcomes for prevention programming. So again, it took us a lot of time before we got there and a lot of patience. And what I can say is you know, we really struggled at a coalition level and uh, our member programs really struggled with that as well. But we wanna make sure that in doing quality prevention programming that we're able to really measure how are the efforts that we're doing really impacting our communities. So in my program highlights, I'm gonna talk about two of our member programs one is the YWCA Women's Resource Center in St. Louis, and then the other is Phelps County Family Crisis Services in Rolla. And so those two programs are roughly 100 miles apart, um, but they are light years uh, apart in terms of the dynamics of those communities. And uh, these two organizations have really found innovative ways to mobilize their communities around their prevention efforts. Both of these programs were part of those 13 originally funded agencies, and uh, both of them used their RPE funds essentially as a springboard for developing sustainable programming that had community investment and that had a really strong investment internally from the staff and the board of their program. So starting out with the YWCA program out of St. Louis, um, the YWCA has uh, created a sexual health and disability education program, and they did that through uh, looking at the St. Louis community as a whole. We have uh, many, many programs in the St. Louis area. All of them are doing really great work, 
But much of the work that they were doing um, was kind of in a silo. And so the YWCA looked at that and identified what population within the St. Louis community are we not really partnering with yet. And so the YWCA and a group of disability service providers created the Safe Circles Coalition. And uh, with the YWCA's involvement in that coalition, it really created an opportunity for folks to engage in a conversation about how people with physical or cognitive disabilities rarely, if ever, receive education on sexuality and intimate relationships. And so they realized that individuals don't just need that education, but parents need that education, their friends, other community members, as well as the caregivers at these organizations, at the disability service uh, provider organizations, also really needed education around what is healthy sexuality, what are healthy relationship dynamics, and how are we making sure that vulnerable populations are getting that information? Um, something that I think surprised all of them once they started having that conversation is really just how marginalized the, this community had been up to that point because it involved them having difficult conversations around none of them really seeing individuals with a physical or cognitive disability as being sexual. But we know that everybody has some sort of sexuality that they define for themselves. And so how are we giving people an opportunity to define their own sexuality and define their own relationship? And so a lot of the early work that they did in that coalition is serving 2,000 caregivers in the St. Louis region and really figuring out what are the needs of those organizations when it comes to providing this sort of sexuality education. So then after they did that needs assessment and did a lot of really difficult conversations with all of the people in that coalition, they attended a, a training out of Illinois and they adapted the We Can Stop Abuse program to meet the needs of what their community essentially said they really needed. And so a couple of lessons learned from that, and I kind of alluded to this already, is they came up with a motto for that coalition of nothing for us without us, because uh, like I had kind of mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the conversations uh, focused around how people with disabilities, as well as their parents, their family members, their friends, and their caregivers at these uh, disability organizations, disability rights organizations, really need to be in that conversation. They need to be the ones telling others what this population needs and uh, then focusing all of their educational efforts around those needs. And so they also really learned that building that community coalition, conducting that needs assessment, and then training staff not only at the YWCA, but at their partner organizations takes a lot of time and so really building in that time to get to know your community, get to know the people you're going to be collaborating with, and really making sure that everyone's voice at the table is heard. And so that organization was originally funded with 35000 just over 35000 um, And that was primarily going to one staff member there who was the one coordinating all of these efforts. And then for the Phelps County Family Crisis Service, they uh, really decided to focus in on a school-based program. And whenever they were looking at their, um, at their county and trying to figure out where they wanted to combine all of their efforts, they realized that they have seven high schools, four middle schools, and uh, over 4,000 students. And so they really had to tailor way down to where they had the best relationships, which schools they had the best relationships with, and where they really needed to focus their efforts. And they also recognized that they really had to switch their way of thinking from we need to reach the highest number of students that we can to uh, focusing down on where is the greatest need for our programming. 
And that took a lot of time for them to get across to their board because in direct services, we tend to think about needing higher numbers to justify our funding. Um, but funding for prevention is very different. So what they ended up doing is really focusing on the schools where they had their best relationship. And uh, they decided to do healthy relationship and consent programming, but focused primarily around media literacy. And so they really wanted to start teaching young folks the skills to identify the dynamics of a healthy relationship through the media that they were already consuming. And so a lot of that was with the music that students were talking about they really enjoyed listening to, the TV shows they were watching, the movies that they were watching, um, and also the books that they were reading. And part of that was uh, Corey, the prevention educator there, recognizing that at some point she'll no longer be relevant and won't be able to really connect with students. So that's why she's also really been working with those schools to develop a peer-led model of programming in the high schools so that it's um, building an opportunity to have uh, youth leadership and uh, have youth engaging with their peers in these conversations around what are healthy relationships and uh, how are we defining that. And then some of their lessons learned, uh, similar to the YWCA's, is they realized they really need to know their community and the dynamics of that community because of how interconnected everything is. So really taking the time early on to get to know the folks on the school board. Luckily, uh, the executive director of that program was formerly on the school board, and so she had a connection there. But then in terms of the faith leaders in that community, a dynamic of Rala is that it is a relatively rural community, and there's a strong religious presence in that community. And so uh, she didn't want to create any programming that was going to be in conflict with that um, and a lot of the values of that community. Another was recognizing that the Rotary Club there has a lot of influence in the school because they provide scholarships for trips as well as providing a lot of funding for the athletics department in the schools. And so they also didn't want to be in conflict with how the Rotary Club felt like they should be doing prevention programming. And so, again, it took a lot of time to develop those relationships because uh, there were a lot of longstanding traditions and close relationships that had already been developed between individuals and organizations in the Rala area. And so taking the time to know and understand those relationships and that dynamic in the end, it really helps them to build a stronger relationship with the schools and in the surrounding community. And they were also funded originally with just over $36,000, and uh, they used uh, that money primarily to fund one prevention educator um, with a little bit of supervision from another person there. So I know that that was a lot, and I think I might have gone over my five minutes just a bit. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Thanks so much, Matthew. I think you were exactly on time. So, hello, everyone. We've arrived on the West Coast in your time zone. And I am Nancy Greenman from the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force. And looking at RPE in Oregon, I um I don't know, I could say I've been doing community organizing since before there was Roe versus Wade, women's studies programs, and um, RPE. And for the past maybe dozen years, I've been in Oregon um, doing um, grant administration to programs and have uh, a pretty good sense of and great admiration for all of the work that's going on in every part of our state. So um, I am going to begin just a real quick look at our history, and it's very much like what um, both Jen and Matthew talked about in their state and what's happening in your state. In 2005, we began to make our transition, the grants were small, but we started to focus on primary prevention as opposed to awareness or um, general education programs. And as 
We funded programs at a higher level. Our expectations sharpened, and um, our the number of programs we were able to fund decreased. I have looked at your RFA, and we um, just uh, started a new cycle of funding in February, and I think our expectations are very close to what you are looking at in Washington State now, including that minimum FTE of 0.8 um, to be funded. Um, we, as other states, our health authority gets the money from CDC and then gives it to us. Um, my job, because we're a small state, small population, and do things in a compact way, I run the program. I provide the technical assistance. I do the RFA. Um, I head the selection process. So it's sort of soup to nuts. And one of the uniquenesses of what we have in our program is we are not the state coalition. We have a fabulous coalition in Oregon. We are in addition to that. And we do training and technical assistance and run on uh, a, an advisory committee um, structure. So we have eight subcommittees that are discipline or focus specific and function all the time as leadership. Um, centers of leadership in Oregon. And this prevention and education subcommittee is made up of a number of stakeholders who have a passion for prevention. And what happens is they develop guidance documents, they are a think tank, they do webinars, and they, through me, communicate with the RPE grantees and other programs doing prevention and have this kind of conversation where the local programs will say, here's what we're doing, here's what we see, here's what we need, and then PEC, as we call it, will respond to that. And we'll see one example of how that um, has um, enriched our overall programming as we look at um, a couple of the programs in the state. So this is a map of the uh, land map between you all and California. And as you can see, most of our state is rural and frontier. I think we're two-thirds public land, and uh, the population tends to be clustered along the I-5 corridor. The two programs I'm going to talk about are Haven that's up in the Dalles right on the gorge, and Women's Crisis Support Team that's in Grant Pass um, pretty close to the California border and on I-5. And they look far apart. Ooh, I don't know how many miles, but it doesn't matter because you couldn't go directly anyway. Um, in fact, because of the way we run the RPE program in Oregon, if you talk to either of those programs and said to them, who's your strongest partner in this work, they'd probably name each other. And that's because we have monthly hour and a half um, meetings. Um, we use Google Hangouts of the grantees. We have annual meetings. And one of the things that we've learned and one of the ways in which we leverage our scarce resources is Generally, preventionists are the only ones in their agency, and, and you tend to get isolated when that's the case. And when you feel, the more you feel part of a conversation and part of a team, the more energy you have for your work and the more exposure you have to other people's lessons learned on an ongoing basis. So... To begin with Haven, this is a profile. I'm not going to read through the, the whole um, slide, except to say that Haven had been getting RPE up to the point where we 
really increased the grants and the expectations, increased the amount of the grants, and therefore became much more competitive. And they lost their grant in 2010. And the way they responded was to say, this matters, and we're going to fund it somehow. So they sought foundation funding. They used some discretionary funds. And they they came to us, the task force, for every opportunity of receiving technical assistance and support. They The element that they continued with were a multi-session um, curriculum and a team theater troupe that we'll look at um, in a moment. And given that sort of can-do attitude and continuation of their program, they came back in 2012 and successfully um, got RPE funding. What they wrote for and what they're funding with RPE is a comprehensive program in the tiny town of Dufer, which is about 20 minutes south of um, the Dalles, if you drive rapidly, and to, to put on a regional uh, healthy team relationship summit. And they, they, at this point, are on their second summit. And I'm showing you their staffing in that they have, and you'll see Women's Crisis Support Team as well, has the same model. And, again, lesson learned, when you're part of a team, it creates a kind of energy and integration into the community and the agency that, really help with sustainability. You not only cover more ground at any given time, I have observed that you really help to sustain your program. And I understand that that's hard to do. I'm just putting it out there as what I observe as really helping prevention integrate deep into the agency. And that kind of integration is true of both of the programs that we're going to look at. And this is a picture of um, the threshing bee in in Dufer in the summertime, and you can see Mount Hood in the distance. So what happened was in 2011 in this tiny community, there was a terrible tragedy, and the town came to Haven and said, can you help us heal? And Haven said, yes, let's have a conversation about what that would look like and determined that a primary prevention program really was um, the thing that would most turn around both the tragedy in the community and point to a more positive community and a more hopeful community. So as you can see, they started, and their focus was the school. Tiny school, one um, class per grade, everybody in the same building, and you can kind of see the whole town from the school. And year by year, they've pushed out um, into lower grades they have articulated the curriculum to pick up the lower grade. They're in classes for the whole year, so there's a lot of dosage. And as you can imagine, as this progression goes on, the youth that are in 10th grade this year have now had a couple of iterations of the education and that will become more and more so as time goes on. And CERT, which is Consent, Equality, Respect, Trust, and Safety, is that is their model. That defines the norms that they're moving towards. And so as they integrate this into the classroom, as they work with the staff, the superintendent is completely on board. Um, this the message starts going home to the parents, and in a community this small, when they wrote their grant, they said, you know, in a small community, change may take a long time to happen, but when it happens, it happens quickly. 
So that is what's been happening in Dufer. Um, they, um, the, I thought it was in this slide, it's not. Um, an example is last year they had the mayor's twins in one of their classes. They were talking about sexual assault awareness month. The twins went home and told their parents. The next thing that happened was they were invited to come to the city council to talk about how could the town take on um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month and really support the work that was being done. The second element that they built on is this teen theater troupe, which is a youth leadership model. The youth meet every week. They um, uh, have had the curriculum. They use their skills and their knowledge to develop skits based on what they've learned and then pre produce those skits in the community, first showing an unhealthy resolution and then inviting people to interrupt and try to uh, try out healthier resolutions. And um, what they did was to use the troop as part of the planning force and the implementation of this Healthy Teen Relationship Summit. So youth um, planned workshops. They co-led workshops with um, adults, and they, they co-offered the keynotes and the closing statements. And in both times, what happened was both youth were empowered by these highly successful community events, but also, and we'll see this also in women's crisis support team, the adults in the community saw that youth were a real resource in changing community norms and creating healthier communities. And that's been a revelation for, I would say, everyone involved. So moving south, to Women's Crisis Support Team, about the same size agency as um, Haven, and they had been doing an education program for quite some time in the schools. They hadn't had RPE since we'd been giving more than a few thousand dollars. They, they decided that they'd been, as they said, a mile wide and an inch deep, um, and they wanted to go deep, and they saw RPE as an opportunity of moving from a more education um, awareness type program to a really concentrated community change strategy. And what they proposed to do was to continue this model they have used of young men and young women's groups. They have gender-specific uh, curriculum delivery at Grants Pass High School, which is the largest high school in the county, and the high school for Grants Pass, just one high school, very beautiful high school. And then from those groups to form a youth action team, a youth leadership team. And again, they have that same model of um, team as Haven has, that is, they have a supervisor who's very much engaged in prevention, and they have an RPE-funded uh, position, and then another position that was an AmeriCorps volunteer, and when AmeriCorps went away, they undertook to fund that position through foundations and discretionary funding. So the young men's and women's groups um, are weekly um, classes that happen in the school that have the support of the school are very popular. There's a little bit of tension between um, the, the WCSP and the school in that the school sees it as um, a source of referral for youth who may, um, they think, need uh, an intervention, and WCSP is simultaneously recruiting from the general population. So what ends up is there's sort of a mix in these groups. But what's true of the groups is they are a safe space, and they're a place where 
youth gain skills where they're empowered, where they learn that their stories are maybe not only their stories, and they feel a part of something. So not surprisingly, what was happening was youth were repeating the curriculum semester after semester after semester, and that's where that idea of going deep came from. We have these youth who get it. Now let's let them do it. So in the the first year of their RPE grants, the second semester, they recruited about a dozen youth to be the youth action team. And they empowered the youth to come up with the community school community campaign that they thought would be most effective. So youth uh, began with an I pledge campaign. They came up with a pledge not to condone, uh, support, or engage in um, gendered violence. They had T-shirts. Youth who wanted to take the pledge could be videoed. They had a Facebook page. They used other social media and pushed this campaign out into the broader school community. In the second year, they continued the campaign and began to speak out at community events. So they went to the domestic violence awareness event and spoke and really liked that experience. And and based on that, WCSP said, well, why don't we have the youth action team go meet with the city and county commissioners to receive the SAM proclamation? So the youth did that. And what happened was, as happened in the summit in Dufer, in, in um, the Dallas, the leadership was just floored by the articulateness and the um, poise of these youth leaders. And the youth leaders on their side of the table thought, aha, these community leaders That is the logical progression of what we're doing now. We get it. And there was just a quantum leap in what the youth felt that they were capable of doing. And so they then determined that they wanted to end the year with an evening of skits that they put together based on um, what they had learned and what they knew and how they believed um, violence prevention can happen. And about in 75 to 100 community leaders, school staff, school administrators, students, families came, and it was wonderful. And so um, I have maybe one minute left. I'm going to end by saying in this third year, building on that empowerment and experience with leadership, what happened was the Prevention and Education Subcommittee had put together a resource called Talking Points, that is how to frame positive conversations in your community. We shared it with the grantees, and WCSP shared it with the youth, who said, we want to do a campaign based on the Talking Points. Sexual violence is preventable, and we all have a role. Stand, speak, act. And they put together what does that mean when you stand, what does that mean when you speak, what does that mean when you act. And what happened was WCSP, the whole agency, took on that campaign as their whole agency campaign so that now in Josephine County, you have a youth-led um, major campaign called Rise Against Violence. And briefly, the lessons learned from the staff were about when you move from teaching to empowering, you learn that that's, you know, you have to give it up to the youth and let them lead. The second is unintended and intended outcomes. Always be open to what you didn't plan to happen, but you see happening. And we'll talk about evaluation in a moment. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Nancy. That was really wonderful and so helpful. Thank you all three. So um, as I said before, if you have any questions you want to know a little bit more about one of the profiles in one of those three states, feel free to send that in the chat feature and we'll get to the question section in just a moment. Um, first, Jen, Matthew, and Nancy are going to share some of their lessons learned and tips for success um, that they have kind of picked up along the way from working with a handful of programs in their state doing more comprehensive and resource saturated work. So Jen, if you want to start and then we'll go to Matthew and then Nancy in the same order that we did before. Sure, um, a, a few things. The first thing I'll say is that um, I, I, we have found it incredibly helpful. Now we know that even with the amount of money we are able to offer local programs that with overhead and then a slight bit taken out for supervision and then supplies and whatnot and training, um, that still, you know, RPE coordinators, there's a, you know, there's a salary problem there. I mean, clearly I would love all of us to be making much more than we do, but the, there's still a bit of a salary problem. And, and what that translates to often is that folks who are coming into the positions are, tend to be folks who come from a social justice positionality in some way, may have been activists uh, in their local communities or in their, on their undergraduate campus, um, but don't have a lot of the skills that, or have, you haven't had the chance to practice a lot of the skills that we're asking of them as part of the North Carolina RPE program. So, in other words, being able to create broad-based coalitions and be able, being able to evaluate in fairly sophisticated ways are really the two things that I'm thinking about. And uh, I learned that, and again, this is just kind of what I have learned to, to value, that, that having someone come in with a social justice and anti-oppression lens already um, is much more valuable than the other pieces and that the other pieces can be taught. But what, but what that looks like is having to provide much more hands-on, in-depth technical assistance. So I spend a lot of time uh, going to local programs, driving around the state, going to local programs and spending, let's say, maybe a full day with folks, helping them create evaluation measures or think about what coalition building could and should look like in their community, thinking about key, key stakeholders, things like that. So for me, as a technical assistance provider, I have found that proactive and intensive technical assistance is incredibly important in concert with folks coming in with an anti-oppression lens already. So, so that has been really awesome. And then also, um, you know, just kind of utilizing these, these bullet points that shifting from quantity to quality, like is written here, uh, has been a, a huge lesson for North Carolina and something that we're still trying to uh, really kind of emphasize around the state. So we still have some programs who are seeing a whole lot of students. And the challenge with that, of course, for folks who are in school, you know that sometimes you can't really go to a superintendent and say, hey, we just want to work in school X with the seventh graders. Largely, they're going to say, well, no. If you're going to take up, let's say, a piece of the health education component of our mandate, we need you to work with every seventh grader in our county or something like that. And, and that is attention. Because that, per, that often does not lead to the saturation we're looking for and still gets us to this place of quantity over quality. So we're really working with that. But we're working very closely, again, with local programs to try to, if they have to work with every student, not that we, of course, we want every student worked with, but again, if they ha if often if they're working with every student, they don't get the saturation. So if they do, if they are working with every student, we help them think about ways that they can navigate conversations with school administrators to get more sessions uh, so that we could get more in sa more saturation. Uh, and then finally, uh, out-of-the-box programming. I'll speak to that for a minute as well. So, again, we don't mandate specific uh, curricula. There are some days that I wish we did only because I think that would make things easier. But easier isn't, you know, necessarily better all the time. 
I do think that um, we, we may go to a formula later in North Carolina, maybe a couple cycles from now, where we are kind of giving them a list. But right now, we're really inviting programs to look at what their community needs and resources are and create programming. Of course, it's important that that programming is evidence-informed. We don't just let them do anything. But create evidence-informed programming based on uh, what their community needs and resources are. So, so we've been pretty successful with that thus far. Of course, there is a lot of kind of, I will say that there is a certain amount of control that we have over that in terms of what they decide to do with the money. But generally, uh, our programs have been really great about creating these really rich evidence-informed programming. So those are some lessons learned uh, that, that uh, I think may be helpful for y'all. Thanks, Jen. That's awesome. Matthew, you have some tips to share with us, too? Absolutely. Great. Um, what I'll say is that the dynamics in Missouri, <clears throat> excuse me, are quite similar to what Jen laid out in North Carolina. Um, I think that we do a lot of skill building with preventionists when they co first come into the work. And even though many of them are coming into it with a social justice background and an anti-oppression lens on things, it does take a bit of time to really get them to focus on more quality programming and not quantity as well. Um, again, like I kind of mentioned earlier, I think because part of that is uh, in direct service work, folks are really looking at how high the numbers are of prevalence in their community, and uh, that is really important to look at and should certainly be used to inform the prevention programming that you're doing but it's hard sometimes for folks to make that shift. Um, along with that, awareness events are great. They're a great foundation for prevention work, but primary prevention work has to go beyond take back the night events on campuses. They have to go beyond uh, proclamations for sexual assault awareness month, domestic violence awareness month, and really need to focus on that uh, quality programming with a very specific population inside of your community because we know that um, that quality programming is what will really be able to change those attitudes and behaviors that lead to perpetration of sexual violence, intimate partner violence, and stalking. Um, and so I think that we do really have to work with folks around the state to help make that shift. But what I can also say is that folks are very open to it. And uh, you can really see that once they start to figure out the dynamics of their own community, then they can create really solid primary prevention programming. And that's also similar to looking at out-of-the-box programming. Um, I think that it's very easy to, especially when you're getting started, look at some of these uh, curriculums and programs that come out on a national level and uh, I think that it's also really important that we do have an evidence base for whatever programming that we're doing. Um, but sometimes if you rely solely on a program that you buy and you're focusing so much on the script and the presentation of that, then it doesn't really come off as authentic and you end up having that disconnect with the community there. And uh, whenever I was talking with the prevention educators at both of the local programs that I highlighted today, they had a, a really similar piece of uh, um, advice that they would share, which was the main thing uh, that they wish they knew when they got into the work was that there isn't a set script or user, or user manual um, uh, for this work. And you need to know your audience and you need to have a knack for presenting to that audience. And uh, you need to feel comfortable with it because otherwise it's going to come off as really forced. So I think that that's why it is really important that we make sure we're focusing on out-of-the-box programming and programming that is tailored to the population we want to work with. Um, additionally, the last thing I'll say, which kind of ties into just that um, network of support and also evaluating the quality of your work, is uh, just the importance of... Uh, having uh, multiple people, both within your organization and in your community, engaged in that conversation so that you can support each other in the work and not feel like you're the only person engaged in it. Um, but also because we really want to make sure that the work we're doing has an impact. And I would say that for you all right now in this change, 
now is the time to be thinking about impact and how you can, uh, as you develop a program, also uh, figure out how to build in uh, evaluation into that and how you can make sure that you're measuring the impact of the programming that you're really wanting to do. Thanks so much, Matthew. Uh, Nancy, we've got uh, about another five or six minutes left for your um, tips for success as well. Okay. So um, I, I, I love what Jen and Matthew both have said. We've been having a conversation about prevention of skill sets with the, among the grantees and just we're reflecting on how the two pieces that most of the programs find they need are both working in um, a sort of classroom or group delivering a curriculum kind of situation, but then also doing community organizing out in the community and how to to how those don't always come together and sort of how to address that. So not an answer, more of a question. And and the other general statement that, that I would make is um, prevention is hard and doing prevention, it's fun, but it's hard because it takes a long time and frequently you go two steps forward and one step backward because we so rely on doing the work in locations that we don't control, um, schools, community locations, whatever. And so just reflecting on that, and I think we all would probably agree that part of our role at the state level is to know that and to try to work on sustainability, but also to try to be support in those step backwards times that everyone, I think just about everyone, experiences. I want to use anything I have left, looking at evaluation, and just reflect on the experience that we've had over the past few years. Um, we've been uh, doing evaluation, urging evaluation on the local level, for years and have put resources into supporting programs to do it. And in this last round from about 2012 through, um, I would say now, uh, we actually at a point we had consultants that were working with the grantees individually. And what we were looking at was this. It seems simple to say pre prevention is about change. What is it that you're hoping to change? Why do you believe the strategy you've selected is likely to bring about that change? And how are you going to measure or document the extent to which you're successful? And that seems fairly straightforward. What we found was that because many of the programs came from a perspective of, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do this because we've been successful doing this, or I'm going to do this because this is what my community wants, or I have a sense that this is a good thing to do. And getting from there to that, what is it that I hope to change? Why do I think what I'm proposing to do will bring about that change, and how will I measure my success in doing that? And then relating that to if I change that, well, how, do, how does that change relate to what I know about preventing violence? Will that change um, address risk factors? Will it enhance what I know to be protective factors? And what we found was in conversation with the grantees, it took probably a matter of years to get to the point where that question and answer completely resonated. And as I said about DUFER, sometimes it takes a long time for change to happen, but when it happens, it happens all at once. We actually discovered that there came a moment where suddenly that just made sense and the road was open and um, our grantees now could be go on the road 
talking about why evaluation is so important to prevention, but it just took a long time and a long conversation to get there. And so I say that, I suppose, because I think I'm talking to many programs and saying, I think you're probably at different points on the road, but it's a good road to be on. And if you stay on it, you'll be glad you did. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. That was really wonderful. Um, so we have just one question that's been submitted through the chat feature. So for everyone else, please um, submit any questions you have or even comments that you have to the chat feature. Um, and if need be, I can always unmute the lines if someone has a pretty long question as well. But I'll get us started on our first one. Um, and I know for sure I remember, Nancy, this will apply to the profile you shared um, but Jen and Matthew, you may also have some thoughts about this. So the question is, for programs who've had substantial weekly presence in the school, was there any pushback from teachers regarding the precious classroom time that they have? So I, I will take a, a first pass at that. This is Nancy. Um, I think that that's a question that very well frames um, the difference between prevention maybe and education or awareness, I would say, or in our practice, we would say that we talk a lot about are you coming in um, sort of unsupported and unheralded to this school environment or are you coming in on on the basis of work that's been done to involve the staff, the administration, whichever parts of the community are relevant to why you're there and what you're hoping to achieve. And and many of the programs, and certainly the two programs that I talked about, have worked and continue to work really daily to feed and nurture those relationships they have with the broader school so that when they go into classrooms, they're seen as value added and not ever as subtraction. And it goes up and down, but um, we talk about the value of having an MOU with the school or some sort of agreement that recognizes that you are bringing a resource and something of value and not taking away time. Thanks. Uh, this is Jen. Um, I, I really love what um, what you just said, Nancy. I thought you it was really lovely, and I completely agree that um, you know we we really try to impress upon folks that um, it, if it's a struggle for you to get into a school and they're really only willing to give you one class and it's begrudgingly, and then you really have to think about what the level of work is that you're going to be able to get done. And, and are you going to be able to really kind of take part in and engage in the level of quality primary prevention work in that building environment that is going to be of utility? Um, so I think uh, for sure that's true. And the, the experiences that I've had in North Carolina are that we have, we, we have had a lot of RPE coordinators, and even some folks who are not funded through RPE, be able to enter into relationships with schools to fulfill the health education mandate that schools have for 7th, 8th, and ninth graders. We have a stipulation um, in our health education mandate for, um, for sexual violence prevention and response and healthy relationships and communication work to be taught. We also have a pretty uh, neat law, it's probably one of the only neat laws at this point in North Carolina called um, the North Carolina School Violence Prevention Act that enables some of that to happen. So they, they have had um, a rather fair amount of success working with schools as kind of the community content expert on those issues to come in. And I also agree with Nancy about the MOU. And the other thing I will say about the MOU, just as a kind of something to think about for folks, is that... Um, I realized uh, that our RPE coordinators, we should have been talking to them much more about having an MOU for the reasons that Nancy said, but also because we have found that we've had some challenges with RPE coordinators coming in who largely do self-identify also as advocates and not realizing that even if they don't, if they don't have an MOU, they're still bound by um, school district policy around mandatory reporting. 
um, and that has been a gigantic problem. So um, I would definitely also recommend that you all kind of think about that and sift through that stuff related to um, district policy so that everybody could be on the same page um, about why you're there and you can help, you can work to build together um, in the district and in the school. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. That's super helpful. Thanks for adding those other considerations that people can kind of tuck away as they start building those school partnerships. We do have another question. Um, so in your three states, have you seen less turnover with prevention staff with these kind of changes towards saturation of resources and uh, this, you know, kind of intensified support air offering? Um, and do you have any tips on, for organizations that may be facing a transition in the prevention role within their program? Uh, it's Nancy. I would say um, it, the more we do to give people a community of support, and, and I, I want to defer to Jen statements about living wage, which I think is also really fundamental to making people feel um, appreciated, wanted in their um, work that they're doing. I think it, it, we've seen that it supports um, longevity. And actually, last year, one of our prevention coordinators was offered one of those county jobs with great benefits and took it and then said, no, 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 I can't leave. I love this work. It's ideal. I can't leave. And so, you know, decided to stay. So could be evidence that, yes, that's true. Thanks, Nancy. Jen and Matthew, do you have any, um, you know, anything you've noticed about the rate of burnout and turnover with preventionists who have, who are at these kind of agencies compared to maybe other agencies or compared to advocacy staff? Because we know generally it's a pretty high rate of turnover. Um, I mean, I'll just say real quickly and then let Matthew share that, um, you know, we definitely have seen less transition um, with a more livable wage. But I will also say that there still is a fair amount of transition because this work is really hard. Um, and when folks are doing this work full time, that with a livable wage, sure, that does give them some flexibility. But it also, because we, um, we give them kind of more deliverables in exchange for that money, uh, there is, I do think, you know, in all honesty, there is a, 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 a high level of burnout, and we try to mitigate that in all the ways we can through really providing a lot of support to them. But, but it, it is a challenge. Thanks, Jen. Um, that's helpful. I think it's definitely something that, you know, will be interesting to see if we notice any changes here in our state as well, kind of as we're going through this transition. Um, so we are just about at the end of our time. It works out pretty perfectly. Thank you so, so much to Jen and Matthew and Nancy for sharing about your state. Um, I've put everyone's contact information up on the screen here, and it will be in that copy of the slides that you'll get in your email very shortly. Um, and our three presenters have offered, if you want to ask some additional questions about their profiles, uh, about the programs that they profiled, um, that you are welcome to contact them. Um, also, just a couple of wrap-up items for you. You should um, have a couple of opportunities either in that follow-up email or may pop up in a new browser window for you to take a short evaluation in SurveyMonkey, and we just encourage you to do that to give us some feedback because we definitely look at those pretty heavily as we plan, tra plan training for the next year. Um, if there was anyone on the call with you that what, didn't sign into the computer themselves, just if you can send me an email so that we can document the attendance accurately. You'll find that recording of the website on, um, the recording of the webinar, sorry, on our website within about a week. Um, and if you have any other questions, if you're in state and you're working on your RP application and you'd like to talk through some ideas, uh, please feel free to contact me for any technical assistance and, of course, um, OCVA as well. So with that, we're going to wrap up, and I really appreciate you spending the last hour and a half with us, and hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Jen. Bye. Bye, y'all.